This is Paul Eckberg from the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stanford University. This video is beta-lactams part two of two, in which we will describe the characteristics of the specific beta-lactam subclasses, including spectrum of activity, clinical uses, and adverse events. The learning objectives include explaining the major characteristics of the four beta-lactam subclasses, with a specific focus on spectrum of activity, main clinical uses, and the adverse effects. You have already seen this diagram that helps compartmentalize this very complex class of antibiotics. It's important to note that this is not a complete listing of every member from every group within each of the four subclasses, but it lists some of the more common members used in clinical practice. As discussed in part one, the penicillins and the cephalosporins are subdivided into groups or generations respectively. Let's look at the penicillins in more detail. The penicillin groups are generally listed from more narrow spectrum groups with mostly gram-positive activity to more broad spectrum groups with activity versus gram-positives, gram-negatives, and even anaerobes. In the top yellow box, the penicillinase-sensitive penicillins, sometimes called natural penicillins, are the oldest penicillins available developed in the 1940s. These penicillins have no activity against bacteria that produce penicillinase enzymes. Remember from the part one video that penicillinase is a type of beta-lactamase. Penicillinase-resistant penicillins, on the other hand, do have activity versus bacteria that produce penicillinases, namely staphylococci. For this reason, the penicillinase-resistant penicillins are often referred to as the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. Finally, extended spectrum penicillins are most commonly formulated and administered in combinations with beta-lactamase inhibitors, or BLIs. The common BLIs used in clinical practice include clavulanic acid, tazobactam, and solbactam. In your reading, you may see ampicillin and amoxicillin listed as amino penicillins, and ticarcillin and piperacillin as antipsudomonal penicillins, but here, for simplicity, I call the entire group, quote, extended spectrum penicillins. Let's start with the narrow spectrum penicillinase sensitive penicillins. These are active against gram positive pathogens, as I previously mentioned, but their use is limited due to resistance, namely the production of penicillinases. They are used rarely in clinical practice, for example, for susceptible group A streptococci or Streptococcus pyogenes for some Streptococcus pneumoniae isolates, Treponema pallidum, and Actinomyces species. For example, the treatment of strep throat, treatment of syphilis, and treatment of pneumonia caused by penicillin-sensitive Streptococcus pneumoniae. With regard to the penicillinase-resistant penicillins, these are also narrow-spectrum against gram-positive cocci, namely staphylococci, including penicillinase-producing staphylococci. These are the drugs of choice for infections due to proven methicillin-susceptible Staphylococcus aureus, or MSSA. These agents should not be used if the clinician suspects methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. Actually, none of the beta-lactams work against MRSA, with the one exception of ceftaroline, which I'll mention in a moment. With regard to the last starred bullet, the terminology here is a bit confusing. Staphylococcus aureus in vitro is tested for methicillin resistance or susceptibility using oxacillin. If a Staph aureus isolate is found to be oxacillin resistant, it's reported as, quote, methicillin resistant, or MRSA. But unfortunately, methicillin is actually not available or used clinically. So what we use clinically include dicloxacillin, which is an oral formulation, and nafcillin, which is an intravenous or IV formulation. Finally, with regard to the extended spectrum penicillins, these again are often combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, such as clavulanate, tazobactam, or solbactam. And these extend their activity to cover beta-lactamase producing gram-negative rods. These have much broader activity than the earlier penicillins mentioned above, with added gram-negative activity and anaerobic activity. And you can see that ticarcillin and piperacillin have some variable anti-pseudomonal activity as well. The beta-lactam BLI combinations are used very commonly in clinical practice. 
Next, we will briefly discuss the monobactam subclass of the beta-lactams. As Trianam, the only available monobactam in the U.S. is narrow-spectrum and that it is only active against gram-negative bacilli and therefore often needs to be used in combination with anti-gram-positive agents in the context of empiric broad-spectrum IV coverage for severe or polymicrobial infections. I'd like to highlight the last bullet here. As Trianam is relatively safe to use in patients who carry a history of penicillin and or cephalosporin drug allergy in that there is no cross-reactivity of estrianam with the other beta-lactams with regard to allergy. Now let's shift over to the cephalosporin subclass, which traditionally has been divided into generations. However, the most recently approved cephalosporins are only available in combination with BLIs and are not commonly classified as, quote, sixth generation. In addition, ceftaroline is often called next generation rather than fifth generation. Regardless, the grouping of cephalosporins is similar to that of the penicillins in that the generations of cephalosporins are ordered by spectrum of activity, from narrower spectrum, mostly gram-positive coverage, to broader spectrum and mostly gram-negative coverage. The one exception here is that ceftaroline, which is considered a next generation or fifth generation cephalosporin, has MRSA activity, which I've highlighted multiple times in the past. Its spectrum of activity, however, is more similar to the third generation cephalosporins. For the first generation cephalosporins, again, these are narrow spectrum, mostly gram positive activity, and very limited gram negative activity. These are primarily used for mild or moderate skin and soft tissue infections that are due to susceptible organisms, such as MSSA, or surgical prophylaxis. The second generation cephalosporins, as you can guess, have slightly more gram-negative activity than the first generation. And they're actually active against some beta-lactamase producing organisms, such as Klebsiella and Haemophilus influenzae, to name a few examples but not those that produce AMP-C types of beta-lactamases that we discussed in the part one video. These agents also have variable anaerobic activity. These agents are primarily used for mild community-acquired pneumonia and sinusitis, as two examples, and other mild community-acquired infections. The third generation cephalosporins have expanded gram-negative coverage but again, not against AMPC or ESBL producing bacteria. And these are used for more serious infections requiring IV therapy in the hospital. For example, community acquired pneumonia that leads to hospitalization, meningitis, and neutropenic fever, to name a few examples. The fourth generation cephalosporins, and there's really only one example here that we use clinically called cefepine, has a spectrum that's similar to that of the third generation cephalosporins, but they have better activity versus Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the Enterobacteriaceae family. Ceftaroline is the only example to date of the fifth generation or next generation cephalosporins. Ceftaroline has a very similar spectrum of activity to the third generation cephalosporins with the added bonus of covering MRSA. Unlike the fourth generation cephalosporins, it does not have activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Finally, the cephalosporin plus beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations have restored activity against gram-negative pathogens that produce beta-lactamases. For example, avibactam that you can see in the box is combined with ceftazidine, a third generation cephalosporin is a novel BLI that has activity against many beta-lactamases, including many AMPC producing pathogens. So these agents have the broadest spectrum of activity among all the cephalosporins. Finally, we will briefly discuss the carbapenem subclass of beta-lactams. The four common carbapenems are listed in the green box. Note that imipenem is administered with a drug called silastatin which inhibits renal dehydropeptidases and prevents deactivation of imipenem. These are among the broadest spectrum antibiotics available. They have activity against many gram-positive pathogens, gram-negative pathogens, and anaerobes. However, unlike other carbapenems listed here, ertapenem has a slightly less broad spectrum of activity, not covering Pseudomonas or Acinetobacter species.
The cephalosporins, as you heard in the part one video, are often reserved for severe infections thought to be polymicrobial or involving multi-drug resistant pathogens. I list a few examples here, such as complicated intra-abdominal infections or nosocomial pneumonia. Clinicians always try to use carbapenem sparing regimens whenever possible to save these important antibiotics as a last line of defense. As mentioned in part one, the beta-lactams are generally well tolerated. This slide lists the major types of adverse events encountered in clinical practice, but this is not an exhaustive list. The first two types of adverse events, hypersensitivity and gastrointestinal events, are the most common and indeed are the most common types of adverse events associated with nearly every antibiotic class. The last three adverse events listed here are uncommon. As you can see, hypersensitivity occurs in approximately 1-5% to of patients, and it's usually a rash. For example, the nonspecific diffuse macular papular rash that you can see in the picture here that was associated with penicillin administration. Rarely you see serious reactions such as anaphylaxis, and there are cross reactions within each subclass, less common in between subclasses, such as between the penicillins and the cephalosporins. One exception is that there's no cross reaction with as treonam with all the other subclasses. And so as treonam can be safely administered to someone with a penicillin or a cephalosporin rash, for example. Gastrointestinal intolerance includes nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And of course, C. difficile associated disease such as pseudomembranous colitis is possible, as this is with nearly every antibiotic class. Renal abnormalities are rare and might include things like interstitial nephritis and very rarely renal failure. And also, hematological abnormalities are rare, including hemolytic anemia, neutropenia, and eosinophilia. Finally, seizures are rare, but we do see them rarely with the carbapenem class and specifically with imipenem. The other listed carbapenems on the carbapenem slide are less commonly associated with seizures.